Well, welcome to the first Sunday of Lent. This year we are doing something quite interesting and a little bit different. We are looking at the seven last words of Jesus. And generally on Good Friday, you would look at all seven together. But what we're going to be doing over this period is we're going to be looking at five of his last words during Lent. And so today, we're looking at the first of Jesus' seven last words, and that can be found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verse 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's holy word. Today the sermonic theme is the perfect apology. I have a colleague who is, was an alcoholic. They say that once a person's an alcoholic, they're always an alcoholic. But that was not how he referred to himself. That was not how he saw himself a couple of decades ago. He would drink beyond what many of us would think is the safe zone. And one, like, one night, like many others, in a bar a couple of blocks away from his home, he had had too much to drink. A few blocks away from his house, he still thought it was safe and that he could make it home in his car. When he woke up, he found himself in jail. He really didn't know what had happened. He didn't know how he had gotten there. But he kind of was able to put two and two together and imagine that something had happened that caused him to be here. While he was sitting in jail, he overheard some of the police officers talking about this man has killed two people. The story was starting to become clearer for him. Oh my God, what have I done? The enormity of this almost drowned him. He served his time and he has never had another drink. He leaned into forgiveness that is available to all of God's children, but it still follows him. He's pretty upbeat, and today he's a pastor. Maybe when Jesus said in this text, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Maybe he was talking about my colleague. Today, as we examine this text, Jesus has been arrested on some trumped up charges. Did you hear me? Trumped up charges. The powers that be among his own want him not just arrested, but they want him dead. This month for Black History Month, I watched Judas and the Black Messiah. Interestingly enough, it is a glimpse of the Black Panthers here in Chicago, led by Fred Hampton. This group fed kids and provided free medical care, among other things. But the FBI targeted them as a terrorist group and sent a spy amongst them and eventually murdered Fred Hampton in his own bed at 21 years old while his fiance was carrying his baby. Raided their home, shot him dead on some trumped up charges that we know today are simply not true. Jesus is in a similar situation where his innocence shouts so much he is bounced back between Pilate and Herod. He is innocent is a phrase every hard pressed, born on the wrong side of privilege, is aware of. But his own wanted him dead. They didn't want to lock him up or move him out of town or tarnish his name. They wanted him dead. And among his last words were, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I'm sure a lot of things come to our mind, but forgiveness ain't one of them. These people come after you so much so in FBI style, they plot and use an informant to kiss you. And all you got to say is forgive them. Oppressed people all over the world often offer up forgiveness they ain't got enough of in the bank to cash. Jean Botham's brother, after listening to a cop share her testimony that she got off work, parked on the wrong floor, and entered another person's apartment and shot him dead, says to his brother's murderer, I forgive you. These, of course, are not the words of her family member. 
These are not the words of his family members. They aren't the words of his mother, but they are the words of his brother. They aren't the words of people who want a big slice of justice served, but the brother speaks anyway. And he puts himself out there defying family roots and he says to this woman, I forgive you. And then he does something even more paramount. He hugs her and he takes a little of the weight that she's carrying off of her. And he quotes John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And then he looks at her and he says, this is where you start. It is a powerful thing to look the situation, the thing or the person causing you so much pain in the eye and say, I forgive you. And what's even more, proclaim that they couldn't possibly know what they are doing. Those people are unconscious to the full magnitude of what they are doing. Their pride and their ego have blinded them to their madness and their attempt to get rid of Jesus at any cost. Even Judas, who followed me around and now allows the powerful system to use him to double-cross me, Judas doesn't know what he's doing. And Peter denying me three times, he doesn't know what he is doing. And right now, this cloud hanging over them is so heavy, it threatens the rivers and oceans to uprise against this barbaric assertion of Jesus' guilt. Forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. And here's where I enter the story. I want to push back a little and say, maybe even if I can't get it at all, maybe if they didn't know all of what they were doing, they had to have had a glimpse of some of what they were doing. They were not clueless. Peter cried. <laughs> Judas committed suicide. And the religious groups came at Jesus with such force, I can't imagine they were not aware of the impact of their trumped-up charges. And Amber, a trained police officer, shot to kill when she could have, according to a prosecutor, done so many other things. She kept saying, I was scared. And after she shot him, she texted <laughs> she text her boyfriend, hurry up. I fucked up. But Jesus, maybe, maybe, maybe they do know. Maybe they do know exactly what they are doing. Forgiveness is beautiful, but it is often put on the shoulders of the ones who have been harmed or hurt. Lucille Sider, one of our podcast guests, struggled for decades to forgive the man who violated her as a teen who happened to have been her sister's husband. She came over one weekend and didn't expect for this to happen. When it finally came out decades later that another female was pressing charges, she knew it was time for her to come forward with her story. But the work of forgiving slapped her purple. It was the dark cloud that kept following her. It took a lot of prayer and a lot of support. Forgiveness can be hard, and yet I wonder if there is more to forgiveness. Forgiveness is when we slap the people who are most stuck. Let it go. It's in God's hands. Christians should forgive. For real healing to occur in our country and in our world, I think forgiveness needs to partner with apologies. Those that have caused harm on a macro and a micro level need to step up, step up to the plate and apologize. Amber said she was sorry, which is not an apology, but she mostly talked about herself. She focused on her own trauma. But how might or have it been if she had stood and entered into a real apology? Some folks apologize for everything and use apologies like we change underwear. And so their apologies don't really feel like apologies. And yet there are some who can't part their lips like America to say we are sorry for centuries of systemic oppression from slavery to Jim Crow to lynchings to inequalities in our justice system. What if those doing the harm were encouraged to apologize? What if perpetrators all over the world started apologizing? What if Epstein, instead of using his money to get away with what he was doing to young girls, would have leaned into his guilt and offered an apology? Or Bill Cosby or the Catholic Church or the Protestant Church. I listened to countless adults stuck 
about how this one act impacted their whole lives? What if we replace the shame culture with an apology culture where folks move from grace to being responsible for the damage of their behavior? Oh yeah, they call it restorative justice. Not damning folks to hell, but you gotta start somewhere. Apologize for what you've done. What if the church was at the head of the apology movement? Now that would be radical for the church. If the state and government won't do it, we can because we answer to God, not humans. And the church has harmed folks. Yes, we have. And it's not about, well, I didn't do it. You're a part of the church. Just last week, I was listening to a fully grown senior adult talk like it happened yesterday about how she was raised by a religious mom. It's one of the reasons today she's not interested in Christianity. All she could see was a mean God who was always mad. She could never understand why God was so mad all of the time. And when she grew up, she knew she wanted nothing to do with that Christian God. Imagine, imagine if the church apologized for what it has done and for its role in the condition of our world. You guys don't know this, but I also consider myself Mennonite and I used to belong to a Mennonite church. And at 50 years in the making, this Mennonite church decided to have an anniversary and we called everybody that had ever been a part of the church to come back. And they provided counselors for people who had been harmed by the church. And they provided an apology. And I thought that was powerful. That in our 50 years of ministry, yes, we've tried to do good. But we acknowledge today that we've also harmed and we've also done wrong. And we have people on the side to help you if you were one of those people that we harm. Those on the margins that have been harmed and damaged don't need our pity. Those who have been harmed don't need our sympathy only. Those who have suffered a hard life do not need our judgment. Those for whom have been dealt a rough life don't, don't just need those shallow things. But what they need is they need our apologies. They need us to fight for legislation. They need us to protect and honor their humanity. I was listening to an advocate on the South Side for homelessness. I didn't even know this sister was here. And she helps people on the South Side who are homeless. I don't mean people that don't have a place to live. I mean people who live on the streets. And last week when it was cold, she took all her people and put them in a hotel. And she talked to the city and said, hey, look, I'm taking these people off the street. Don't touch their stuff. And she promised them, she gave them her word. And so they followed her and she put them in hotels and kept them warm. And while they were in hotels, guess what the city of Chicago did? The city of Chicago came and took all their stuff and threw it away. Yeah, it might be junk and it might look like junk to some of us, but it was all that they had. She didn't blame the city, she didn't go off and give excuses about the city, but she came to her people and she said, I am sorry. I am sorry because I gave you my word that if you went into a hotel, your stuff would be there when you got back. And I am sorry that your belongings were treated in the way they were treated by this city. An apology is to feel deeply remorseful for the turn of events that happened to others. And sometimes it's the first step and sometimes it's the only step. But she said that and then she began to shop and try to replace their items. She hit the stores and is doing fundraising to replace as much as she can. The perfect apology says, I'm sorry, period. You know, sometimes when people apologize, they say, but, no, 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 no buts. The perfect apology enters into, I am sorry that this happened to you. I'm sorry for the ways in which my actions or my participation in a group's actions brought considerable pain and harm to your life. I'm sorry I crossed the line. I'm sorry for my own insecurities and unhealed parts that led me to act in horrific ways that only spread more hurt and pain. 
I'm sorry I didn't check myself. I'm sorry I used the Bible to oppress and limit certain people's humanity. I'm sorry I spoke without much thought for the weight of my actions and the privilege I take for granted. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make it right. I'm willing to journey with you. I'm willing to support you. I am sorry. That's the perfect apology. Forgiveness is a gift we offer to others when we can and when sometimes the Spirit helps us because the Spirit's got to help us sometimes to forgive some folks. But my colleague, my colleague, when he woke up in that jail and discovered that he had killed two people, he needed that forgiveness. And I imagine in the course of your life you've needed, I've sure needed that forgiveness. It is the offering of kindness and grace when maybe it appears the person doesn't deserve it. And yet forgiveness partner, forgiveness partner is apologizing. Apologizing, that needs to be embraced too. And we need to be able to say that we're sorry for when we do things wrong. Not, you know what I mean. You know, we can be so loud when we're wrong, and so rude, so obnoxious, and then when it comes time to apologize, we're so quiet. Who are the people that could benefit during this Lent season from our apology? Not our excuses, not our reasons. Who could benefit from hearing us apologize? from hearing our remorse for what we've done, from hearing how sorry we are for what we did, for hearing how sorry the church is for what it did, for hearing America is sorry for what it has done. And yet the text reminds us, it reminds us that there are so many that are in need of forgiveness that Jesus offers to. Because maybe in all of the knowing, maybe really, maybe we really don't know what we're doing at all. Amen. <laughs>